Great. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, and thanks everyone for coming and joining me today. I hope I'm sounding clear and looking clear enough. Uh, not too clear though, because I didn't put a lot of makeup on this morning. So hopefully you can't see everything. But uh, you should be able to see my screen share at this point. And we're going to be talking today about how to yeah, integrate. We're seeing it highly magnified. Oh, sorry. Let's change that. Thank you. Should be better now. Yeah, much better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so this talk is kind of a dual purpose. Um, it can be directly given to caregivers as a framework of helping them start practicing AEC at home. Um, but since I believe we only have professionals in the room today, I'm going to give it more of a professional spin. Um, and I think that what you'll find in this talk is a framework that you can then use to add to your current strategies for coaching families on how they can integrate AEC at home. And um, I work with families who are at different stages of their comfort with AAC, uh, but I'm going to share a case with you today um, that I've been working with for a long time, this family, and I've gotten the pleasure of seeing them uh, grow into being more comfortable AAC partners for their young one. Um, and so I'm hoping that some of what, what I discuss with you and, and share if we have time through video um, can help you see not just the learner's progress, we know that that's what we're trying to go for and anything that we do as professionals is helping our learners grow in their competency with AEC. But I think what I've been uh, really pleased to witness with this particular family and others is the, the growth in the family. Um, and, I, and I firmly believe that if we take an approach that helps us really support families and really harnessing their strengths as partners because they have so many of them that they're not aware of many of the time when they when they come to us, um, that we can give them the tools they need to fish rather than just the fish themselves, right? So when we're absent and we can't be there with these families, if we focus on fostering these skills and helping them recognize growth in themselves, I believe it has a longer lasting impact um, on the journey for the AEC user as well. You can learn a little bit more about me here on my slide. I'm not going to go into details. Um, I do have uh, relationships with everything on this slide here, including my role as an employee of Goalie. Uh, however, I'm not going to be talking about anything on this slide today as far as my uh, relationships with these organizations, with the exception of Accessible, uh, which is here on the top left hand side. And that is the nonprofit organization uh, where you'll see a lot of the resources in today's slide are linked to that website. If you have any questions for me about uh, today's presentation that we don't get a chance to get to, please don't hesitate to reach out to me via email. I'm on social, um, and I really love having conversations uh, about this topic. I'm, I'm kind of an AAC geek, and I, and I love talking about it with anybody and everybody who will listen. So this is the little guy on, our, on my mind today as I'm chatting with you all. Um, I'm curious, I had posted a question um, before we got started about whether or not there were certain questions in your mind today, or maybe clients in mind, families in mind, that you're hoping to get some nuggets of information to help you coach and guide these families. So as you listen to the talk this morning, if you have uh, questions that are popping up, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We will have a reserve time at the end for questions, but I, I really love to address them as they come up as well. Um, and if you have priorities for your own learning, also put those in the chat because then we'll uh, make sure we focus in heavily on those pieces more than others. Uh, but let me give you a little snapshot of this little guy. Um, so his family has given me permission to use his image and also his first name. And so this is Owen. Um, and Owen and his family have been working with me for about, I want to say, two and a half years. Uh, we started our relationship together when COVID started. Um, and Owen's family was really looking for someone to help them understand how to do more for Owen because during COVID, we all needed to do things at home, right? Um, and more importantly for Owen, his family was having a really hard time finding an educational program that was well matched to his needs. Um, and so they were really eager to bolster what he was getting by becoming a little bit stronger at helping him communicate at home. So when I met Owen, uh, he his main strategy for communicating was screaming. Um, and he had lots of different screams. He had a really wonderful way of varying his pitch. Um, the challenge with it was, first and foremost, his family was quite stressed at all, the screaming, right? Because that's kind of hard. 
Um, but also, it was not a conventional way for him to express himself, obviously. And so there wasn't a lot of clarity for them. So although they really wanted their best to, to acknowledge his communication through his screaming, they didn't know what it meant because it was kind of like the word for everything was a scream. Um, and so keep that in mind. I don't know if you have children that you've worked with that are like this, um, that are very vocal um, and maybe even seem very intense and uh, aggressive in their vocalizations. And even when they're not particularly uh, upset or uncomfortable, it's just kind of like they don't have a lot of control over their voice. Um, and I'd love for you to keep him in your mind as that starting point. And when we see him at the end of the video, I'd love to see what you think about changes in his communication style. Um, and I think what's most important with Owen's journey is um, you're going to notice as we talk about him through the slides, this isn't all about Owen using AAC picture based all the time. He actually uses a huge multimodal AAC system that isn't just his picture-based system. It involves gestures, facial expressions, modulated vocalization, um, yes and no signals. He's got a really rich way of communicating. And I'd say in a big circle, about this much is picture-based right now. The rest of it is other forms of AEC. And so you'll see as we talk through modeling and supporting learning at home that we've coached this family to really focus on these strategies as well. We're not making it all about the pictures all the time because we want to get from screaming to more conventional, robust, clear ways of communicating that also include pictures. So I'm going to talk about Owen as we go through each of the slides today, um, and we're going to start off just like cutting to the chase. Our focus of AAC training at home for families is to help them speak AAC so that they can teach AAC. And so today's talk is all about modeling, but I'm going to get a little deeper into how do we help families understand what does modeling actually look like? They know they're supposed to do it. Many of them know that they're supposed to do it, but really thinking about how it's supposed to look, especially for children who are a little bit earlier in their developmental stage can be challenging for families to wrap their mind around. We're not gonna watch that video. We're gonna watch another one later, but here's a framework that I used with Owen's family and with others that I support in the coaching relationship as far as helping them break this down into a task stepwise task that they can kind of wrap their heads around and, and feel like they're growing in over time. Um, so we're going to reference this slide a lot as we go through, but let's just give you the big picture here. How are we going to model AEC at home? We're going to prepare. We're going to create opportunities. We're going to support interaction and learning, model language, of course, and then we're going to inspire, don't require, which is a Rachel Madel quote, uh, but I think fits really well when it comes to this idea of honoring all the ways in which kids communicate and using those as a springboard in our AAC teaching process, rather than putting AAC pictures up on this pedestal and, and the rest of the stuff down here. So we'll go into each one of these in detail together as we talk through Owen. Um, and the first thing that I think a lot of our families bring to the table as strengths is they really know their communicator. Many of the families I work with are the best translators on the planet. They understand what their kids need. Um, and sometimes it's really helping them identify how those strengths of knowing their child can come up in AEC learning and teaching as being a powerful springboard for them to teach other things. Um, they think of this idea of being a responsive partner as very separate from teaching words in a lot of cases. But the first thing I like parents to do is really understand how they already know their communicator. And if there are gaps in that skill, I wanna help them understand how to get to know their communicator even better and how to help other people in the family get to know the communicator better. So learning that communicator style of communication, and I'm gonna talk about this as signals today. So this idea of signals, I'm thinking of those as things that are not symbol-based. They're all the other stuff that is used to communicate that's not symbol-based, meaning not a word, a sign, or a picture, um, a spoken word, a sign, or a picture. So we wanna discover what is this child already doing to communicate? This is particularly important for families that come to you and they tell you that their child is not communicating. 
And we probably know for 99.9999999% of the cases, that's just not true. But it is hard sometimes to understand what the child might com be communicating and how. Um, and so we might take this first step and we might spend months here with some families, just really helping them observe and be patient and listen and really assume that the child is being intentional so that they can start building a dictionary of sorts of all of these signals that the child is using. I don't know if anybody in the room has ever used a communication dictionary before. Um, I'm going to pop my chat open, take a breath and see if anybody's got ideas. Nonverbal autistic daughter, and I'm very familiar with the screaming, the Gishandra. You know, it's a blessing to hear that sound, but also really challenging for families. Has anybody used a communication dictionary or a signal inventory before? Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? I It's not a term I'm familiar with. Sure. So for children who are using mostly these signals um, that are not symbolic, this can be a really helpful way to put on paper uh, the ways in which the child is already communicating. I don't have a slide in the short presentation today, but if you go to the website, um, which I have a slide for at the end, you'll see we have some resources on how to create one. It's basically a spreadsheet. You can do it in a lot of different ways. Um, and the hope is that you'll capture the signal, what the child is doing. You'll capture what the context is for that signal. So when does this happen? Maybe it's during a mealtime or playtime context. Um, and then you'll capture, what do we think this means? So as partners, when this child does this during this context, what do we believe it means? Um, and then the fourth column and final column is, what are we gonna do in response? And so in this early part of learning your communicator, the response for families may just be, we're gonna honor these signals as intentional, valid forms of communication, and we're gonna respond naturally to them. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail in a moment. But as you build confidence in, in families, you may add to the response column. You might say, okay, in this context, when Owen does this, and we think it means this, with fair certainty, we think it means this, you're gonna respond naturally, and you're gonna model some words on AEC that relate to the message. So we can build up that response to be a teaching response while also honoring that signal as truth. Like this, you communicated with me using that signal. I understand and now I'm going to enhance your message by showing you the pictures and the words that go along with it. So helping families at this stage create a communication dictionary if their child is rather unconventional in the ways they communicate can be a really powerful place to help them see their strengths help them learn more about the things that you notice in this child's communication that could be good potential signals to build on, and also share with everybody else in the team and in the family that may be a little less versed in understanding this communicator's ways of, of signaling things so that they can be consistently responsive as well. Part of this first step is also just, we need to discover what kids love, right? We're gonna create opportunities for learning around what they love and also what overwhelms them. Um, maybe we wanna avoid the things that overwhelm them entirely because we don't want a child becoming dysregulated in our learning moment if we can avoid it. Um, but sometimes we wanna use some of those overwhelm moments as learning opportunities too. And so we're gonna help families kind of distinguish when is the good time for me to start trying to teach more? And when is a good time for me to just help my child regulate and get through the moment? Because not every moment is an AAC teaching moment, right? If we're in a puddle on the floor, it's probably not a good learning moment. So for children that are still working on that regulation and working on that engagement, we want to really power in on those AEC joyful moments, the ones that are all around love and motivation and probably a little less of those overwhelm moments. I put this slide in here for the benefit of any families that may uh, want some examples of what signals could look like. Um, so thinking about communication outside of the box, right? Things like challenging behavior, um, use of gaze, changes in vocal tone, all of these things can be seen as communicative. And when we re recognize them and respond to them in a very consistent way, what we notice is kids then start relying on them and using them more, which is exactly what we want to see. We want to get these conversations going. So this could be a helpful slide for you to share with families in your own way 
um, to help them recognize some potential communication that's happening. Some families really need some support, maybe not all of the time, but some of the time in spotting the communication that's happening. Um, and I always uh, help families and, and graduate students that I mentor understand if you don't understand what a child's already doing to communicate, you're not going to know when to model or what to model on the AAC system. So a lot of complaints I get in the early modeling process from families I've worked with um, that are just starting with me is I'm just I'm modeling all the time, but he doesn't pay attention. He's not watching me. He doesn't seem to care. Um, I feel like, you know, it's not really productive. And I think that part of that problem stems from really not recognizing the magic moment to start modeling. And, and I believe that comes from what the child is already communicating. And we'll talk in a minute about contingent modeling as being the strategy where we're going to model what matches the child's message. And then the other chatter that we do maybe in and around our interactions where the child's not communicating is our stimulation. And how do we balance stimulation and contingent modeling so that we're giving enough space for kids to fill with their own communication. We're modeling what matches their interests the best, but also giving them those developmental concepts that they might not know or are not interested in yet through our stimulation. Um, we'll break that down a little bit more in a minute, but for families, they first need to understand what's happening in this context and how is it showing communicative intent in my child. So these are some of the strategies that I suggest families um, kind of employ, and we'll do this in a side-by-side -side way. So the first thing I'll do is I always model this behavior for any caregiver I'm working with. So for Owen's family, um, highly responsive mom, straight out of the gate, she was very good at assuming pretty much everything that he did was intentional, which is fantastic. But some of his, uh, his uh, signals were a little bit more subtle, especially when he started to control his voice. So we had sessions where I would um, interact with Owen, and we were all virtual, and I would um, pose an activity or a question and then sit and wait and observe. And then I would think out loud for mom so that she could observe what I was seeing and what I thought it meant. So I'd say, oh, I see, I heard your, I heard your small little, uh, I think that was a yes voice. And I see that your body is happy and you're smiling. I wonder if you want to do that idea that I just gave you. And so I would talk to Owen and I would talk about what I was seeing for the benefit of mom so that she could see the things that I was noticing and what I thought they meant. Now, I don't know if they were right, but you'll, the kids will tell you if you're wrong. They have a really good way of telling you when you're not on mark. Uh, but it was really helpful for mom to be able to tune into those little, little things he was doing when she got to see someone in the moment and she was an outside viewer and she got to really pick up on some of those things without having to be in it with him. So I'd model some of these ideas of what are they looking at? Um, what is the child doing, right? What is their action? What are they saying? And that could be with words or any other signals. Um, and how do they seem to be feeling about what's going on? So we're gonna look for all of these things, we're gonna assign meaning to them, and then we're gonna respond accordingly. And we'll talk about that in the modeling piece. Another thing we wanna do for families is help them prepare to be good modeling partners by learning the system. This is a step that's often missed in coaching, um, but you can't help a child learn the system if they know it better than you. You have to know it better than them. And that might mean that you just know it a little bit better than them for a little while. And that's fine. Your learning curve is going to be what it is. But um, we have to make sure that we give families ideas and time and space to really learn that system. And with Owen's family, I started her on the first page. And I recommend this for any beginning partner. Um, it's very overwhelming to have to go further into an AEC system and feel like you have to learn all of the words all of the time in order to be a good partner. That's not true. So we start out with Owen's pod book, keeping him on the front page, which is the quick fire words. I don't know if anybody in the room is familiar with pod, but there's two pages of quick words. And that's what the family learned first. We went through, I had um, his mom and dad do AAC date nights where they would pick a night or two out of the week and they would communicate with each other and try to find one word per sentence on those quick fire word pages just to get the flow of, you know, 
what you notice when you become a really confident partner is you start to think in terms of the words on the system. I call this thinking in core when I'm talking to families. So you learn to kind of talk about things using the words that you know are on the system. But until you get more familiar with that, it doesn't kind of come out that way. For many families, they have something they want to say, and they're very tempted to want to fumble through the book and find the exact word that matches. So in doing this with, with Owen's family, we really helped them hone in on everything that you say. Try to find at least one word on these two pages that you could model in your date night. And um, over time, they got very familiar with the quick words. So we moved to the branches in pod. Um, but we're still at the point where navigating through the book is challenging for them. So we're getting better and better as we go. And the more that they uh, model, the, the more savvy they get at finding the things that they want to model. But I think the, the trick here is really just helping families learn the system and then giving them a manageable process for doing that, giving them permission to simplify it if they, if they need it simplified, which is maybe starting on that first page. Another part of preparing is um, these tools need to be available, right? We say if the AAC is not around, you can't use it. Um, but I think it's not enough to say that. I feel like families need specific examples. Um, and so I coach families very early on to wear the AAC. And um, you can see two examples of wearable AAC here. There's a high-tech strap or a pod book on a homemade strap. So when possible, and I'm not militant about it, I say, I really want you wearing this because if you're wearing it, you guys are communication partners here. You're always with Owen when he when he's talking, right? So if you if the words are with you as a partner, then we know they're always with Owen. Um, so first uh, clue for them is let's wear it as much as we can, and then I also encourage families to use other supports when it's possible um, and when it's when it's helpful, right? So here you can see the idea of putting activity based communication where the activity happens. This is a playground example. This is a sandbox example. So this is still hitting on that idea of giving families permission to use other things other than the child's AAC system when it makes the difference between modeling or not modeling. Um, and that might mean that they're light tech supports. It might mean that they're um, core boards that are more generic than their, than their specialized or individualized system. <laughs> All right, so another thing that I really love to help families understand is how important it is to control your environment a little bit when you're modeling at home. Now, this does not make it mean making it a clinical environment because that's not what this talk is about. It's about being natural and being at home. But I think that uh, when families don't see kids being successful with engaging in models, they get very discouraged very quickly. This is especially true for kids who have a hard time paying attention, sticking with something for a long period of time. And most of those challenges are likely very developmentally appropriate for that child, but that doesn't ease how frustrating it is for a parent who's trying to get the child to play and engage. So I try to help families take a look at their interactions. And we do this through observation, we review videos sometimes, and think about ways that we can help to improve focus if that's a really big pain point for them. Um, for some kids, it's recognizing where they're most focused and making sure that you use some of those strategies some of the time. Maybe that's a high chair like this little one. Maybe it's um, a supported seating chair like a Riften or a wheelchair. Um, but realizing also that being constrained in an environment where they can't get out and explore is not the best place for them to be all of the time when they're learning AAC. Because we know how important it is for them to be able to explore in their way. Um, and to kind of guide you to what they want to talk about. So in addition to limiting distractions and improving focus strategies, I encourage families to, of course, play on the floor. Um, and that's going to look different for kids with different bodies. Some of our kids can't play as successfully on the floor, so they need different positions. And we talk through that with the team. Um, you know, maybe AAC is not going to be well attended to if a child's trying control their body on the floor, and they're not a strong independent sitter yet. So then we have to figure out, okay, well, then what are we focusing on language-wise when this child is rolling around on the floor? It's probably not picture-based AAC, but it might be these other signals that we want to embrace and help them learn. I also encourage families to join where the child is, and you all know this following the child's lead, but 
sometimes families don't really know what that looks like. So we're going to talk in a minute about what it actually looks like. Um, and then whatever you are doing together as a family, I always encourage them to be in a position for success. A lot of families don't really uh, notice how their child interacts differently when they're next to them versus in front of them or behind them versus in front of them. And so as I'm observing and trying to figure out ways to increase focus and engagement around play and AC, I might coach families to think about their positioning and how that is supporting or taking away from the interaction. So this is a good example of two problems. Anybody notice what might be wrong in positioning on the left-hand side here? I'm going to answer Gil's question while you guys think about um, think about the question I gave you. So Gil asked, are you teaching Owen the same pages as the family, or is he learning other pages too in relation to using the first two pages? Yeah, so when uh, we're modeling for Owen, I am modeling all the pages, and that's helping Owen's family and Owen follow the path in the pod chain, right? When I am encouraging the family to have focused modeling, I'm saying, okay, the very first priority is use quick words or branches. But if you feel froggy and Owen is ready, go deeper. Take advantage of a moment where he's engaged. There's no like right or wrong here, but no pressure on the other pages. Your job as a family and your learning is the first two pages. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, difficult to see the child's communication when behind them. Absolutely. Child is not facing the parents. You got it. So this is a really common book reading posture. Let's put the kid in our lap. However, it's not a great language learning posture to have a child in your lap. It may help their body and it might help them feel cozy and secure. But if I'm using book reading to model AC or to model facial expression or other signals, this position is not great. What about this one on the right hand side? What looks wrong there? Overstimulation station, that's right. So our families don't have to have, uh, you know, sterile home environments. There's a lot of stuff that comes with life. But if I'm in a home with a family where I see a child is uh, one of those children who really loves to bounce from one toy to the other, I might coach them on how to engineer the environment to help that child sustain their focus a little bit better. And this is common therapy stuff, right? We, we take this for granted, but not a lot of parents realize how the environment impacts their children until they have a moment to see it uh, with someone else kind of guiding them. So once we've gotten all that preparation done, um, and just a kind of a caveat on, on Owen's case, uh, Owen is in a wheelchair most of the time, um, which has been a huge game changer for him because all of a sudden he can move around and he can move around in a way that his body is controlled. So he can move around and he can think about other things other than just moving his body all the time. So as he's been able to move around in his wheelchair, we've noticed better positioning for him to learn a lot of the communication signals that he's using, including a nod of the head and a shake of the head. Um, and also he has like this whole world he can explore now. And so his family can follow his lead. They don't have to bring everything to him. They can really join him and communicate where he's going so that there's just more richness there. Because if you have to engineer every experience, it becomes a little bit trickier to have robust language. So that's kind of a segue into this idea of routines. Families know what routines are. I, I don't think that they know as much about how to use them for teaching moments. Um, and so I've got a little cheat sheet here on, first of all, how do we help families identify routines that are good language learning moments? Um, and I think, as you can see, it's kind of a simple cheat sheet. If it's not fun and the child doesn't want to do it, find another routine. <laughs> that's the big takeaway from this slide. Um, Toy linning, probably not a great place to learn language in this early stage, right? If they don't like it and it's not fun, move away from it and go to something that is. But I also love to help other, help families understand other aspects of routines that make them valuable teaching moments. And you can see a few here on the slide. Um, first and foremost, a routine has something for both people to do. 
This isn't just the family acting on the child. This isn't just the child playing and you watching. A routine has a role for everybody to play. And I highly recommend if you are working with kids and families who um, are at the stage of trying to find things to do so that they can find things to talk about, all of the Hannon materials available on Hannon's website are huge help here. Canon is all about routines, which ones are great for different kids at different stages. And I put a, a couple books here that they have as well. So in those play and predictable routines that we've identified as strengths uh, in teaching, we really want to keep our sessions pretty short. So with Owen's family, I asked them to pick a few of the most obvious routines that were joyful to him to start out. And they were only modeling during those routines for several months. And then as his mother got a little bit more comfortable, she found that there was more opportunity to work modeling in his pod into other routines throughout their day. Um, and for that, she was using a more of a stimulation approach, but the contingent modeling, meaning modeling what Owen was saying using pictures, that happened still within those first two routines for quite some time. Um, and with Owen, it was challenging for him because he's not a kid who has very strong play skills. I'm sure that you all know a few children like this. Um, and when children are hard to play with, it tends to be difficult to find times where you could then model language for them that's not around them asking for things, right? Like foods or toys. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what are the things that bring Owen the biggest glimmer in his eye that make him chuckle and giggle the most. Usually it's being silly, fart sounds are involved, monster sounds are involved. So we just insert a lot of fart sounds and monster sounds into a lot of things that we do where they wouldn't otherwise be. Um, another thing that we see with Owen is he loves music. So in the video that I'll show you, um, if we have time, you'll see that I'm actually singing a lot of the words to trigger memory and meaning for him. So um, we were working on core words with his two first pages and we were doing uh, kind of like these fixed lessons around the words and we'd find Daniel Tiger songs for every single word that we were targeting. So when I'd scan through the words and when mom would scan through them, she'd get to one and she'd say, should we sing about thank you for everything you do? So she'd sing a little bit of the song to emphasize the word so that he could understand and, and use experiences with that song to tell us whether or not he wanted to sing about that word. So music, fart sounds, monster sounds, um, that was really what we needed to do in order to find Owen's interests. And then we kept those modeling sessions really short. And anytime that a child's showing us that they need a break or they don't want to do this anymore, we stop. We don't persist. Five and 10 minutes a couple times a day is really powerful when it comes to modeling. So in addition to following that child's lead from a standpoint of, are they interested and engaged in, in learning with me today? Um, we also wanna figure out, okay, what is it that we should be talking about? How do I use the child's lead to help me understand that? We already talked about being face-to-face -face as being a super important strategy, um, but a lot of us need some help learning how to be playful, including parents. We always wanna kind of be in the teacher role, but how do I be a play partner? And part of the AAC modeling magic is that I do what the child's doing. If they're giggling at something that's not on my agenda, we take a moment and we go down that path for a little while because that's what they're leading us to. That is what's meaningful. And that's therefore what we need to be modeling on our AAC. So following their lead means doing what they're doing. Keep going as long as they want with those fart sounds um, and figure out how to work your words in to the fart sounds. Maybe it's a comment. Uh, maybe it's a question. Uh, what kind of fart sound do you like better, mom? There's a lot of ways you can use different communication functions around something as simple as a fart sound. Another thing that Owen really loves is he loves to mouth. And he's a kid whose brain is telling him to mouth things. So we roll with it. We talk about what do we do with this toy? And when he puts it in his mouth, it's, oh, it's a great one to put in your mouth. He also loves to spin. So we talk about the spinning. So we're just in his world and we're talking about words that are meaningful to what he's enjoying rather than shifting the play to what we think we need to be talking about as adult partners.
All right, so we talked about prepare, we talked about create, we're creating opportunities in those routines and following the child's interest. Sometimes we need to adapt things for kids, which goes beyond what we can talk about in this talk at length, um, especially when it comes to adapting for physical and visual needs. But this is a huge point for parents to understand and for us to support and teaming with them. If a child can't access their world because they have a visual or a physical impairment, there's going to be very little that they can talk about with you. So it needs to be in parallel that we help children and families adapt their world to give that child more ability to explore and learn. It's not that we need to wait for them to get better at those things before we can talk about language. It's that we need to be thinking about, okay, we want to talk about, you know, new words related to this activity, but if he is not an active participant in that activity, he's not going to have as much meaning from my words. So how do I then adapt the materials, his positioning, et cetera, in order for him to be more of an active learner? Another way of the adaptation that I, I really love parents to focus on more so in, in their own way and rather than in a teaming way is make yourself more interesting. You should be adding to the fun. That means you need to use your voice, your body language, your facial expressions. You need to really make that child's eye glimmer and keep going with that when you see them uh, kind of latching onto it. They call this in the DIR model, uh, therapeutic use of self, if anybody's familiar with it. And you'll see a lot of it um, in our video that we'll share in just a minute here. Another way that you offer support is we have to presume competence and intention in all of our communicators. And we need to help families do this too. I don't know if you have experienced this, but I have encountered many families who through various interactions with professionals and medical staff have really been fed a story that their child doesn't have a lot of potential. And it hasn't been said to them in that way, but it's been said to them in an indirect way that's led to them feeling that way. Um, and it's really difficult to believe that your child can do more when everyone around you seems to be telling you otherwise. Uh, so we just spend a lot of time really helping families um, validate their own belief here. My child is a communicator. They are a learner. They learn differently, and it's up to me to figure out how to help them learn. Um, but they are a learner, and when we, when we move from that standpoint, conversations change with children. When, when I converse with you as though everything that you are doing is intentional, all of a sudden there's more communication terms happening, there's less questioning and testing, and it's kind of a beautiful shift that happens in the dialogue. And you're gonna see that with Owen's mom when we, when we see him together. All right, so another way of supporting, um, and we've got, so we've got prepare, we created opportunities, we're ready to model. Um, we want to know what to model. And I think the main takeaway here that I love to give families is we're going to model the thing that matches what your child's already communicating. So if they're going, ah, what are we modeling? Give me a couple core words that go with. Ah. Always lose my chat. Stop. No. Yeah. All done. Different. Right. Don't. No more. So you can see, you can go from the single word to the phrase level. And it's all going to depend on where that child is. And, and I kind of coach families based on the brown stage that their child's in. So if they're at pre-brown stage one, we're focused on first word learning. So I, I take the pressure off. I say, your job, mom, is one word at a time on the AAC device. You can say as many words as you think you want to in order to, to, to communicate with your child, but your job is one word at a time on the AAC device. If they're you know, a single word user, then we're moving them into brand stage one or two. We really wanna beef up those two word combinations. So I might coach them, that family around, how do I add to what the child's saying with a two word semantic relation? Goes beyond what we can talk about in this short class. But if we've got SLPs in the room, this is probably you know, your, your gravy here. You understand this. But I think we really want to help families know, first and foremost, match the child's message. Think of different types of words, right? Think of different types of words. So what if I did, mm, and I wanted to not use an action word, I wanted to use a comment. What's a comment that you could match with that signal?
I don't like it. Absolutely. If you want to get silly with it in the family vernacular is like that, this stinks. Uh, Owen's family does a, um, what is, what does she say? Trash it or smash it. It's like a thumbs up, thumbs down system that they use for music. So that's their common. It's trash it. I don't like it. So thinking about ways to help families use different types of words, use words in different ways, right, um, can be a helpful way to even have families give more versatility to their single word models. There's some resources in your slides on these word map templates uh, that may be helpful for some of the families you're working with when you sit down together and look at those motivating, joyful AAC routines. Let's brainstorm the language that we could model during these routines that match the things that the child loves the most about them. So there's a free template that I linked for you all. Um, it looks like this, um, and it really coaches you as partners and families to go through and think about what are the core words, what are the fringe words, what are some phrases that really get to the heart of this activity um, that we can have on our radar as we get more and more confident in modeling. I also gave you a little cheat sheet here that could be helpful to share with families on that one-up rule that we learn in speech therapy school. Um, how much do I model? It's one above where the child is currently at. Uh, so if they're not using uh, any words, we're going to model single words. If they're first word users, we're going to model one to two keywords, etc. We also want to help families really understand that they need to model the oops. They're going to mess up a lot when they try to find words in the beginning. Um, and we are too. And so we need the child to see that and we need to have a way of talking about that. So pod has a beautiful built in mechanism. It's the oops, right? Oh, that's not what I wanted to say. Oops, I need to go back and find uh, a different word. <clears throat> All right. So the last piece on our framework before we end with our video is this idea of inspiring and not requiring. Um, I think in my experience, children who are emerging communicators, um, we do them well to make sure that we help their family understand the power of non-symbolic communication signals. In development, this is what children go through. They, they learn how to gesture and use signals of all kinds before they use words. So our job as AAC models and partners is to really help families value those other means um, and, and be really natural and responsive in the way that they, that they um, approach their, their interactions. So there's a little bit of a do's and try not to do's here. Uh, when I say natural, it means that when that child goes like this, you don't make them say it again in a different way. I see you're smiling. You like this. You like this. You don't say then, tell me that you like it. Push the button on the device, right? And a lot of families will think that that's what you want to see them do because they, in their mind, is, we're supposed to be using these pictures. So really important to understand the importance of first, I respond naturally to what the child did. I can always model in my response without any pressure. I can inspire that child to learn a new word by modeling um, that word in my response as I'm acknowledging what they already told me. Um, let's see here. Okay, that's all I wanted to say there. And then the last slide before we pop in to watch a little bit of Owen is a lot of families ask me, how much do I need to do this? How much do I have to do this modeling stuff? And you know, SLPs in the room are like all the time, every day, all day. <laughs> which is just not reasonable. And so I've asked families to really challenge themselves to create goals with me um, around habit change. And so I've got this little scale that we use, you know, where is your baseline? Are you at zero? Are you at rarely? Let's see if we can move you up a half a notch or a quarter of a notch. Um, and let's figure out a way for us to measure that and keep you accountable, uh, not to shame you, but to try to identify what were the barriers in, in helping you get to that notch up and how do we adjust our approach so that we can limit those barriers and you feel like this is more of a attainable goal for you and your family. You've got a resource tab at the end of your slides, lots of free stuff on the website to help coaching um, and also help in just general intervention with AC. All right, so I have until 15 after, right, Gail? That's correct. Cool. I'm gonna stop here as I get my video ready and just see if anybody has questions, things that I missed. 
in the very rocket fast presentation that I just threw at you. You know, one of the things that uh, that I was I wanted to say was um, you have some lovely ways of talking to families about using AAC. Like one of the things I, I wrote down a lot of quotes today, but one of the things I wrote down was make yourself more interesting. I love that as a as a goal for not only families, but also for classroom staff. So thank you for, yeah. for the way you approach this topic. Yeah, you know, I know that the classroom staff probably feels this pressure. Um, I have the luxury of not working in a, an environment that requires me to follow academic um, benchmarks. And in for families, I think that um, our culture really tells them that if the child's not working, on something very obvious and they're not learning. And for so for a lot of families, I think that they really need to know that it's okay to just play, to be silly, to go off task, um, to do something that seems completely ridiculous and unimportant. And it's through kind of modeling for them and then reflecting with them that they can see, oh my gosh, you're right. We, we did talk about words while we were making farting noises. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought that I could do that. But definitely harder for school staff to, to take the pressure off of how do I stop working on academics for a minute to really follow where this child's taking me? Because you've got this task, right, of working on communication and academics simultaneously. And that wasn't the way it was supposed to be, right? It was supposed to be you have communication and then you get into school. And so it is challenging sometimes to balance all of that. Anybody else have comments or questions before we take a little peek at Owen and we can chat about him as well? Looks like Alyssa. Hi, I have a quick question. I put it in the chat, but I think it got um, it got lost in there. But um, can you explain a little bit more about contingent modeling? And then um, I'm guessing there's an alternate or some sort of like parent yes. narration. I've explained it to families or teachers and staff, but I, I, I like that you have a terminology for it. Yeah, and I realized um, that I told you guys a lie. I said it was coming up and then those two slides ended up getting cut last night when I was short on time. So let me pull pull one up in case you wanna take a screenshot of the definition. Oh, and then I'm going to um, also just explain it in words, give you a word picture. Let me just find this line really quick. So contingent modeling is um, what I consider, in, um, first and foremost, the, there's a resource that could really be helpful in giving you more um, valuable words to talk about this with families. Anything by um, Ann Kaiser at Vanderbilt that's on the enhanced milieu teaching approach. Enhanced milieu teaching is not meant for children who use AAC necessarily out of the research box, but I find those strategies incredibly helpful when I'm thinking about how do I talk about this with families? What does contingent modeling mean to them? So let me open this slide really quick so you can take a picture. But I consider contingent modeling to be what's what do we do when the child's already communicating? So when they are already communicating something to us using a signal or a word, our shift then becomes to contingently modeling. And that definition, right, is I model contingent upon what you're already telling me. So I match your model, I match your signal rather, by giving you one or more words that are related to that message. Now within contingent modeling, we can also use language expansion, right? Which is a common technique for SLPs working with late talkers. So I can, if, I, if Owen goes, mm, I can say, oh, no, right? That's a contingent model. You want, this is an expansion, me to stop. That's also an expansion. So contingent modeling, and then I expanded on Owen's idea of no. In contrast, if I have it, no, it's a hidden slide. Lang um, language stimulation, modeling for, and this is the difference between aid and language modeling and aid and language stimulation in some of the research. Stimulation is going to come about when the child's not communicating. So they may be engaged and interacting with you, but not communicating with their own signals in that given moment. And so you can shift to stimulation mode. Um, 
I don't think I can find the slide, but I'll just give you a word picture. And so that's just like language stimulation in, in this traditional speech and language sense. I'm going to pay attention to the child's focus. What are they looking at, doing, interested in, feeling? But I'm going to give a word picture around it. I'm going to be the narrator, parallel talk, right? Self-talk, parallel talk with AEC. Does that help? Yes. Um, can I ask one more follow-up question about it? Of course. It? Okay. So this is just a very recent, um, uh, some feedback that I got from an SLP who is using, like implementing a core modeling, um, universal core strategy in the preschool classrooms that she works with. And she realized that she gave this really great presentation about uh, modeling and universal core and attributing meaning. Um, but what she's observing is the paraprofessionals primarily using stimulation. So they're using, they're modeling all day throughout. They're using the boards, they're pointing to pictures, but what they're doing is modeling what like they want to say. So saying things like, oh, you know, I'm, it looks like you're still hungry, but we're all done or, or using it more for behavior. Like, oh, you need to stop, you know, stop, we're all done. And so they're not, so I, that using that terminology, that contingent, I think will be really helpful for her to talk to the staff about do you have any recommendations on how to balance those two? Like, should we only primarily be focusing on contingent modeling anytime they're showing us signals or is there um, a space in there also for what they're currently doing stimulation? Yeah, so in my experience, um, when focus stimulation becomes the priority, it's usually because they are um, perhaps not as familiar with the learner as they need to be. So there are communication signals that are happening and not being uh, noticed. Would you say that that fits some of the students in question with these paras? Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I would start my training not in let's hit this mark of X contingent modeling and Y language stimulation. It's OK, we're missing some moments here. Let's take a look at how we can identify them. Because think about it when you're talking to a, a one year old who is typically developing you're talking 90% of the time and the child's probably saying nothing. <laughs> and it's because you don't expect them to say anything. And so the interaction becomes very heavy on the stimulation and low on the contingency. So I think that helping them recognize what the child's already saying, then you can say, okay, we're gonna have a goal during this activity to stimulate and wait, wait until an initiation happens. Now that initiation might be the child changes activity might be that the child walks away. It might be that the child expresses a smile, flaps, jumps, vocalizes. I don't know what it will be, but you get to say one thing and then you have to be quiet and you have to watch, well, how is this child going to initiate? I've just learned about how they do different signals. And I think if you help them kind of focus on that volley, then you may notice the balance goes where it needs to without setting a number to it. Yeah. I think that kids who are hard to play with also, we tend to just want to talk because it's really uncomfortable to be around a child who doesn't play with you and you think like you need to fill the air with word vomit. Um, and so I find that when I help people understand how to engage with kids that are a little bit different in their engagement, that they also then are waiting for more of those signals to the child to take the play where it needs to go. Does anybody else have any ideas? for this challenge or any thoughts about balance? All right. Well, I'm gonna let you meet Owen. We're not gonna get to watch his whole video, but um, he's really cute and super smart and so fun to work with. So I feel like it's just gonna brighten your day to meet him in general. Let me open his little video up. So just a little background, um, Owen has a lot of diagnoses, none of which I think are relevant to actually working with him, um, but with that he does have a lot of limitations, uh, physical limitations and uh, visual limitations. I do not talk about cognitive limitations with Owen, and it isn't because I don't believe that cognitive limitations exist, it's because I don't think it's relevant. Um, I can't measure Owen's ability to think and understand because I don't have the tools in this earth to do that. And so we interact with Owen the way we would interact with a seven-year-old of any, of any type. And his mother has really embraced that. Um, and I believe it has done wonders for Owen's confidence and for his ability to participate in communication exchanges with us. 
Um, hopefully you can see this. Let me know, Gail, if it looks too small. Uh, we're seeing multiple videos. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make sure I share my sound. And I'm gonna make this one really big. How's that look? Great. Perfect. But I kind of um, like, okay, ready? We have. It's funny. <laughs> it's very funny. So I want to set this clip up a little bit. Um, we had asked Owen, he had indicated he had something to say with his signals. And so mom brought out his pod and she was going to scan for him. They're using partner assisted scanning. And she said, when you're ready to, when you're ready to tell me about it, look at me. And he kind of did like one of these numbers where he looked out of the side of his eye. And she said, I think you kind of looked at me from the side. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to go. And then I made like a side eye gesture and he thought it was the funniest thing ever. So it would have been tempting to want to write, redirect him back, come on, tell us what you want. But instead, what we did was we sat in the side eye moment because he was glowing and he was having so much fun. And I didn't get to model words on AEC, but what I modeled for him was communicative terms, right? Circles of communication. You giggled, I said, that's funny. Then he giggled again, that's really funny. And through that, we build relationship. We show mom how to have a conversation without pictured words. And he gets confidence as the communicator. Okay, are you telling me you're ready for your words? Okay, no, don't, can't, want, hug. Is it one of those words? No. Okay, do you want something to eat or drink? Toys, rest, take a break. Is that what you want? That sounded like a happy sound. It did sound like a happy sound. So I want to pause again here. How do you feel about the clarity of Owen's yes, no signal here? And I just minimized the share for a moment so I can see you all better. Do you think he's being super clear with yes and no as mom is scanning through his uh, choices? It's not totally clear, but one of the things that she's doing really well is what we've worked a lot on, giving him feedback, right? Okay, well, you you look back at me. I think you're ready to use your words now. And what that tells him is, um, first of all, I think what you're doing is intentional. Secondly, here's what I think it means. So if you agree, keep doing it if you want that to happen, right? And then it shapes him for the future to continue to use that gesture if he wants to repeat that meaning. So kids don't always have great awareness of what they're doing and what it means to you. So giving a little bit of feedback can really go a long way, even if she's not sure. And so here she's looking for a yes, but he's not giving it to her right now. He's going, nah, and she's like, that sounds like your happy voice. I think that might be what you mean. And so she's going to follow that path and see if she's right. I think I have maybe one more minute to show you another clip. Um, let me go down here. Looks like we have four minutes. Four, oh, I have four more minutes to show yeah. you the clip. Look at that. If it doesn't take me four minutes to get the clip up, then <laughs> we we'll do get to have, go. Yeah, we do have a good comment in here from Kelly as well. Gail, oh, great. Wanna... Yeah, uh, Kelly says um, that she's got construction going on at her house. So, But um, <laughs> she said, I... In relationship to the question about the staff modeling, I use the strategy of being an accomplice from Gail mm -hmm. Porter when I see staff who are using the student's AC system to talk at them, giving them the idea that they're um, that that they are there to be an accomplice to the child and what he or she can say. I also emphasize to them that children often stop using their AC system when somebody's always giving them directions with their own voice and that's being disciplined with their own voice is just a weird thing to do. So that was that was a comment from Kelly, but show us your video. Kelly, yeah. 
All right, so here we go. So this is a continuation of that moment that we just shared with Owen. Um, and the gap that you don't see is he, mom finally went down the, the pragmatic branch of I want because uh, she landed on with his signal. And she, um, they landed on I want a toy, gave a nice yes for I want a toy. Uh, can you see that, Gail? Yeah, it's good. Perfect, okay. So we're going to see a little bit of that moment follow through. All right, I'll wait here. I'm going to wait. Turn the page. I am going to wait so that you can get something to play. Because you said more to say, I want toys. Mm -hmm. Go get them. They're all behind you. Oh, you're all back. Yeah, good job. Okay, here, I'll help we you can do our table. choice time. There they are. Do you see one of the toys you want to show Tana? Hmm. Do you want me to come with you? Am I the toy? What? Hmm. Want to go together? Hmm. Yeah, okay, let's go together. Thank you for telling me. Okay. Toys are over here. Yeah. Are you gonna come with me? Come on, come on. Oh, and our big slinky. Whoa! Oh, is this a toy you want? Yeah, okay. I'll help you take it back. Good job holding on to it. Whoa, Tiana's gonna be really excited. Wow! <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> that is really cool. Show me how you use it. You can put it in your mouth. Yeah. And I hear it. It's going. Mm. So I'm just going to pause for the sake of time, but one of the things that you'll notice in mom's uh, communication just now is that um, she started with pod. She followed the branch. She set the communicative intent based on Owen's signal. They went together. She asked some yes, no questions. Do you want me to come with you? Should we go together? He said, yes. They went together. They followed through. She then offered a forced choice. He picked the toy he wanted. They went back. And then we used a lot of non-verbal, non-symbolic communication exchanges to share that toy. And what you didn't see as the clip ended is I then went on to model commenting about what I thought about his cool toy, um, that it was really cool, that it was my favorite, that I loved it. And so we got to expand on his smile and his joy by showing him some words. And I think we're out of time. Thank you so much. I, I want us to have twice as much time because you've had so much to offer and we need to see some more of Owen. But thank you for being here today, um, for joining us and, and sharing your take on um, involvement with families. Um, I see all kinds of good comments in the chat. This was very helpful been excellent so much that we can immediately use. And I think that's one of the big um, takeaways for all of our echo sessions is when we can have things that we can use immediately that that's the most valuable session. So thank you for being here. Um, we will stop the recording, but um, if anybody has additional comments or um, 